Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks so much for such a great turnout. These are um, a really nice way of uh, raising very important funds for the trust. So, um, thank you so much um, for, for, for turning out in such big numbers. Um, I am not a historian, um, I'm a zoologist, and I'm kind of um, mindful of the fact that this is about historical whaling and involved skills that I had to acquire and um, this, this body of research, because um, it involved going into archives, which was all very new to me. Um, but my focus on this presentation is going to be um, about the ecological aspects of what we can learn from whaling catch data. And all of these um, whaling data are from Scottish waters, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in, in that locally. Um, so it's from um, 1903 up until 1951. That's the period that I'll be that I'll be dealing with. Um, I'm quite fascinated by the um, cultural and kind of social historical aspects as well, um, but they're not really something that I'll delve into in much detail uh, in this presentation. Um, but before I start, I wanted to plug this book, which I read in two sittings, and it's called The Whalers of Harris by. Ian Hart. And if you're interested in the kind of more kind of social history and even industrial archaeology side of, of things to do with this whaling, um, definitely um, get yourself a copy of that. It just came out last year. Um, so that's The Whalers of Harris by Ian Hart. I'm going to focus more on the what we can find out about the ecology of whales from, from these um, um, logbooks, these whaling logbooks. So the way I decided to structure the talk is around these kind of four topics. And um, looking at Scotland's role in global whaling, um, and also then focusing mostly on the domestic whaling in Scotland, um, looking at why this whaling operation in Scotland has been so, was so damaging, and then the kind of big question of it all really, which is kind of the impetus of, of this whole exercise for me, um, are we seeing post whaling recovery in, in Scotland? So starting off about Scotland's role in, um, in whaling globally, Scotland had an incredibly important part to play uh, in whaling um, in every ocean, essentially, and particularly in the Southern Ocean around Antarctica. And if you're interested in learning more about um, Scotland's history or Scotland's involvement in, in whaling globally, um, there's a fantastic resource here um, by Chesley Sanger um, on whalinghistory.org. So um, that kind of period of Scotland's uh, whaling history was, it was 1750 to 1910. And I'm not going to cover any of that. That's all been well covered by a lot of other authors. Um, and in that period from, from 1750 to 1910, um, Scottish whalers left Scotland on ships for months on end. Uh, they went to the Northern Whale Fishery or the Southern Whale Fishery as they, as they called it. Um, Northern was to the Arctic waters, in particular in, um, in search of bowhead whales, which were very, very prized and valuable for them. And um, if you're interested in that, um, like I say, this website is a very good resource. It's an important precursor to, the, to, their, um, to our domestic whaling, which is whaling that was based in Scottish waters. So why were Scotland and Scottish people so interested in, so interested in whaling? Um, it, it kind of goes back to the British Empire. Um, we, um, or I shouldn't say we, I'm not, I'm not Scottish, but um, um, the, there was a lot of um, resources that required oil, essentially, in order to produce products. And um, I, for me, rope and sailcloth are probably the most interesting ones. So in the 18th and 19th century, Scotland had a huge uh, amount of and jute coming in from, um, from various parts of the empire. And in order to produce rope and sail from jute, you need um, a large amount of oil and wax to soften the jute and, and then work it into rope and into sailcloth. And it's interesting, the rope and sailcloth back then in the 17th, 18th and 19th century, um, to have those in abundance meant power. It meant power to go and um, explore new places and to go and capture new places. Um, so they were hungry for whale oil, essentially, and because they had all these other resources and they wanted to 
and ink rope and sailcloth. Um, so these are pictures from Bengal um, where jute is being uh, harvested there. And I think this photograph of the tall ships is, is from, um, from Leith. So I'm speaking to you about five minutes away from Leith in Edinburgh at the moment, and I'm about a 20 minute walk from a harpoon gun that's in Leith and um, down by the coast. Um, and it's a, quite a stark reminder um, of the importance of Scotland in the global kind of whaling efforts. And there's another Leith um, which I visit fairly regularly um, in South Georgia. And this is an aerial photograph of Leith, Leith Harbour in South Georgia. It was the biggest um, shore-based whaling station in the world. And it was owned by a Norwegian uh, born but Scottish um, uh, businessman, uh, Christian Salvinson. And you can see there the dates from 1909 to 1965. So while there was whaling happening in Scottish waters, there was also this massive operation underway in very distant waters in South Georgia. Um, but that helped kind of keep the Scottish whaling afloat. When things were not going so well in Scotland, they would send ships and resources back up from, from Leith and or from South Georgia. And certainly they were using some of the profits from the Southern Ocean whaling to kind of prop up the whaling back home in Scotland when things weren't going so well. Um, this is a fantastic picture um, because it's a colour photograph of a whaling station called Hoosfeek in South Georgia in 1956. Um, and yeah, this is uh, what whaling still looks like today. In fact, in, in Iceland and other places, industrial shore based whaling looks like this. Um, something which I won't cover. Um, will be the factory ship whaling. It was really conducted um, and shrouded in secrecy where the ships were at, very, at various times. Um, and But just to note that Scotland and Britain generally had a big part to play in, in these um, factory ships, which kind of roamed the seas um, and operated out of scrutiny. Um, the introduction of factory whaling ships allowed whalers to triple their um, catch of whales um, essentially overnight once these uh, factory whaling ships started um, to, to operate. Um, so there was about 40,000 whales a year being caught in the Southern Ocean from, from, whale, uh, from ships like this in, in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so that's a bit, that's a kind of an introduction about the background about um, Scotland's um, role in, in whaling globally, and particularly in the Southern Ocean. Um, from now on, I'm really going to talk about the domestic whaling. So whaling that was carried out from, from the coast of Scotland. And this is domestic whaling that was um, from shore-based whaling stations. So the, the kind of setup was you'd have a factory on shore, like the kind of pictures I showed you, um, and you'd have a, a fleet of catcher boats, and those catcher boats would go out and bring whales back to the, the station for processing. Um, here are the cetaceans of the world, and here are the species that have been recorded more than once in Scotland. So at a glance, you can see that we have uh, and have had um, all of the largest species that roam the planet's oceans uh, occur in Scottish waters, including blue and, and fin whales in particular, and they were um, the targets of, of the whaling. Um, there were eight species targeted, and um, but some kind of opportunistically, perhaps, like there was only one example of where they where they landed a killer whale. And these are species that are extinct in Scotland. Um, and it's not quite sure yet why the grey whales went extinct here. Although if you're interested in finding out why, um, there is a scientist named Yuri van der Hoek. And Yuri's work is fascinating and it's ongoing and looking at um, archaeological evidence from Scotland. Um, there's lots of grey whale remains in archaeological digs from around Scotland. Um, and they occur um, as often as minke whales occur in archaeological digs. So that's quite interesting. Um, so they were roaming our seas until the 1700s when they went extinct. And um, the right whales are the most abundant species of whale found in archaeological digs in Scotland. 
and they are now extinct in, in our waters. And I'll talk a bit more in detail about that. And it's pretty obvious why the right whales went extinct, and that was because of industrial whaling. Um, something I was kind of quite passionate about speaking about when I worked in the Whale and Dolphin Trust um, was the shifting baseline syndrome. And uh, that is, you know, this, this idea that with every successive generation, we kind of forget what things used to be like, or at least we don't have firsthand experience of it. And um, so we become increasingly kind of complacent or kind of, I don't know, satisfied is, a, is a, probably an extreme word to use, but we, be, we become used to um, the assemblage of animals and plants and whatever that's around us. And we forget the ones that have went extinct. Um, so um, when we talk about extinct whales in Scotland, we talk about species that are gone from cultural memory. There's no, no longer people telling stories and talking about right whales, and they probably would have been uh, not so long ago, and they seem to have gone extinct in the 1930s. This is a photograph of um, Boona Venator, and this was the whaling station in Harris in West Loch Tarbert. And you can still see it today. It was operational until as recently as 1951. Um, I'm just overlaying a photograph of what it looks like today. And uh, you can still see the remains of the, um, the ramp where they would have hauled the whales up and the uh, flensing plan, which is where they would have uh, processed the whales. And you can still see one of the chimney stacks. There were originally three. Um, but you can still see one of the stacks still standing. And it's probably one of the, it's, it is one of the best preserved whaling stations um, in, of that era in the Northern Hemisphere. But sadly, it is gone um, kind of beyond recognition. And I think it's, it'd be great if it was um, restored, not obviously restored to the point where it would be whaling again, but just restored as a reminder um, of our impacts on, on the populations of whales. Um, this is an image I recently came across, um, and it is a picture of a right whale on a flensing, on the on that very flensing plan that I showed you in the picture. So this is a northern right whale, um, probably around the early 1900s, 1906, 1907, something like that, and it's hauled up on uh, and ready for processing. Um, so just a reminder that these these whales were very much um, in in our waters. These right whales. Um, when the Norwegians came to Scotland for to set up whaling stations, uh, at that time it was thought that right whales may have already been extinct. Um, but when they found them, they were very excited about them and actually quite secretive about them, it seems. Here's an example of uh, one of the whaling ships, uh, one of the catcher boats that was operating in, in the Hebrides. Uh, this one's called Harris, and the H on the funnel um, denoted uh, was from the Harpoonin Company, which was based in Norway. Um, so um, a lot of the revenue and assets and the hardware, if you like, for the whaling that was conducted in Scotland was, was from Norway. Um, I find it fascinating that the whaling history in Scotland shares many, uh, resemb resembles the salmon farming in many ways in the sense that it much of the revenue and kind of senior management personnel um, are primarily from Norway, the serious Norwegian investment abroad um, and ownership of companies which appear to be Scottish, but are actually uh, owned by, by Norwegian investors. Um, and Norway carrying out its business abroad because of environmental standards at home becoming too strict. So Norwegians banned whaling in, in coastal Norway um, and these whaling companies had to up and leave and go elsewhere. And that's exactly what we're seeing um, with salmon farming today. Um, you know, salmon farms in both in Scotland and in places like South America and the Chilean fjords, for example. Um, there are similarities as well in the sense that um, uh, between salmon farming, industrial scale salmon farming, and the whaling, because um, the whaling caused division in communities. Um, some people were quite um, for it because it was it was making uh, jobs and job opportunities that hadn't existed previously, um, and others were very much opposed to it because of the environmental concerns and the impacts. Um, 
So when whaling collapsed as a viable enterprise in Scotland, um, because there was a shortage of whales, a lot of the catcher boats um, went down to the Southern Ocean. And, and that's kind of where the history of the Scottish whaling or the, the um, domestic Scottish whaling kind of ends. In fact, they took entire um, plants and parts of whaling stations and moved those down to the Southern Ocean as well. So a lot of the, um, the physical evidence of, of the whaling history on shore in Scotland has been often moved because it was moved to a place where there were still um, uh, whales, uh, plenty of whales to be caught. Um, so this is the, these are catch records of whales in Norona whaling station, which was in Shetland. Um, I don't think I mentioned it, but there were five whaling stations in Scotland and they were all on islands. Um, one was in the Isle of Harris, but four were in Shetland. And actually, um, the um, bulk of the whale um, catches were in, in Shetland because there were four stations there. Um, there were also two whaling stations in Ireland um, when it was under British occupation. And um, so they were considered British whaling stations as well. So there were seven whaling stations in the area. And there was a lot of sharing of expertise, knowledge, ships, that kind of thing between the, between the stations. Um, very early on, legislation required whaling companies to report to the British government how many whales they'd caught and uh, what length they were, what sex they were, that kind of thing. And it's from these records that I um, pieced together um, a, um, a record of the distribution of the whale catches. So I was particularly keen on knowing where were the whales caught exactly out at sea, um, because they would those records would give us an indication about what was it like in the seas back then, where how many whales were in different places, where were the real concentration of whales, what was the species assemblage like, the species richness, that kind of thing. Also, you can see there there's dates um, that would tell us about the seasonality of whale presence. And these are things that we could compare to the modern day and see um, how things differ. Um, my main contribution to this was digitizing what you see in the red box. Um, other people had typed up um, the species, the sex, the length, the date, and that kind of thing in the International Whaling in the um, yeah the International Whaling Commission, but they hadn't yet digitized the catch locations. So that's what I did, um, and we were kind of joking at the start before you guys all arrived that um, this is the kind of research that one can do from their bedroom um, during lockdown, which is how I did it, and um, it's kind of painstaking and slow, but um, the results are, are worth it. So I digitized um, the catch locations with help from people from the Outer Hebrides and from Shetland, just to make sure that I was getting the place names correct because there's lots of variations on local place names. Um, the result of going through all those records and, and processing them and double checking them and, um, was uh, this paper, which uh, came out recently in the Journal of Aquatic Marine and Freshwater Ecosystems. And that's uh, the next uh, few slides are going to be mostly uh, the results of that paper. And so the main finding really was that the last time whaling records were examined in any detail from this industry was way back in 1976. Um, and back then it was um, thought that there was uh, 9,600 whales had been landed in Scotland. Um, we found out there was actually closer to 10,000 um, whales landed. There were, so, there were some missing data that we kind of uncovered. Um, the total catch, there wasn't a huge difference. We added you know, a, a couple of percentage points to the total number of whales landed. But what was very interesting was um, blue whales had been underreported by 25%, which is quite significant and 27% in sperm whales. So we uncovered the, the fact that there was yeah, quite a significant um, difference in what we thought um, there were in, in terms of blue whale numbers uh, versus what was actually landed. And bear in mind all of the statistics I'm gonna mention here are um, about landings. Um, in order to land a whale, the whalers will have struck and lost a few other whales. So maybe the harpoon um, hit and detonated, but came loose. 
so they might have uh, not been able to retrieve the whale, or there were certainly cases when they were towing them back to the stations where they were caught out in a gale and whales in tow um, became undone and uh, untethered and were lost at sea. Um, so with a, we kind of worked out a crude um, struck and lost rate and actually there was over 10,000 whales probably, uh, probably killed. And this is an absolute minimum. These were just the ones that the whalers were, were reporting. And there's increasing evidence that they didn't report the entire catch. So all we can go is with is um, this as a, as a minimum. Um, I was also very interested in the distribution of the catches, like I mentioned, because that would tell us about where the whales were living um, in you know over 100 years ago and more than 100 years ago. Um, so this graph here shows, or this uh, map shows you the um, the whaling grounds, and um, these are just boxes around where all the whales were caught in the different whaling stations. Um, so can we trust the whaling data that were recorded by whaling companies? Um, early on in the industry in Scotland, in the early 1900s, they had no real reason to lie about what they were uh, documenting, what they had no real reason to lie in the logbooks because there weren't any laws dictating any catch limits, any limits on what species they could take or what length. Um, and when we plotted the uh, length estimates, myself and my colleagues, I should say, um, these uh, the research I'm presenting here is not just my own, but um, input from Susie Cauldron, um, Russell Leeper, and Cherry Allison as well from the Whaling Commission, and uh, Denise Reich from SAMS. Um, so when we plotted all of the uh, lengths, um, the lengths of the different whales that were were uh, documented in these whalers' logbooks, we found that actually they they looked real, they looked believable. You get these lovely bell-shaped curves, and you, you, you don't get bell-shaped curves in data sets that have been systematically um, falsified. So um, we we inclined to believe certainly the len length estimates, and that gave us more confidence in, in the data set as well uh, in general. And um, like I said, they had no real reason to lie because um, there weren't many laws to have to break back then <laughs> in Britain when it came to um, came to whaling. Um, there's a key question, I suppose you might be wondering is, was the level of whaling that they carried out sustainable? In, in other words, were, were populations in a, in a state of decline or were the whale numbers able to compensate for the losses um, from, from the from the whaling? Um, we had a look at this it was quite tricky because um, if anyone does whale watching from land or from a boat as you'll know your effort is very important you know how much time or how much distance did you cover and um, to see x number of whales and um, when analyzing whaling data that's important as well and it's very hard to establish how much effort these whalers put in um, what we did have is access for a few years, we had access to the number of trips that they conducted and then the number of whales landed. So we looked at whales landed per trip and divided it in species. And we found some interesting trends. Um, the species that are probably um, worst recovered um, or locally extinct, they all showed declines in catch per unit effort. So the number of um, say whales, right whales and humpback whales that these whalers caught per trip went down continuously in the whaling period. Um, perhaps a surprise might be the number of whales caught per trip went up for fin whales. And you might think that does that mean fin whales uh, were in a state of recovery while the whalers were catching them? And that's why they caught more per trip. Um, but you have to bear in mind that as the whaling industry was evolving, vessels became faster, stronger, and they were able to stay out for longer. So the trips were becoming longer. At any rate, um, just because they were catching or landing more fin whales per, per trip doesn't necessarily mean that fin whale population was in a, in a good state of recovery. Rather, it just meant that they were uh, more effective at catching them and finding them. Um, so this is what the map looks like when we mapped all of the, uh, the eight species that were caught, and this is all species lumps together. So this is just a kind of a heat map, if you like, of um, where whales were being, being hunted. And you can see there's two real hotspots um, northwest of St Kilda, um, and the, the real core hotspot is northwest of Shetland. Um, 
although there were eight species involved, two thirds of them were were fin whales. So fin whale was the real species that they were they were targeting. This is a different way of looking at the same data set. So the the hexagons are bigger essentially, but just kind of highlighting those two um, hotspots. It was interesting that fin whales were fin whales were the kind of main quarry. Um, fin whales really evaded capture um, a long, long time for a long time because uh, whalers didn't have vessels fast enough to keep up with them. And this is a picture of a fin whale hightailing it. And you can see the wake it's making. This fin whale overtook our ship and we were doing 15 knots. Um, so not a very easy whale to catch. But as soon as they had um, vessels capable of doing 15 knots or 16 knots, they were able to catch fin whales. And that's what they did uh, in Scotland. Um, over over 5,000, almost 6,000 fin whales landed um, in, in the Scottish whaling stations. Um, blue whales, um, almost unheard of these days in Scottish waters. Um, the only blue whale I've seen, the closest blue whale I've seen to Scotland was this one to the south of Ireland in, in 2016. Um, and here's a blue whale alongside one of the catcher vessels. You can tell it's a blue whale because it has a mottled belly and a, a white pectoral fin. Um, so this is the whale catcher ship Empire Unitas 5, which was the last one that was operational in Scotland um, uh, until May uh, 1951. Um, so they used to use St Kilda as a depot. Um, they would catch whales, uh, raft them up and, and buoy them up in, in the bay in St Kilda um, and then transfer them onwards to, to um, Harris. And the St Kildans were okay with this because um, despite the this, this smell and um, because it meant they got free trips to the mainland or sorry, to, to the Outer Hebrides at least on, on the whaling, on the whale catcher boats. Like I said, there were thought to be 400 whale, uh, blue whales killed in Scottish waters for a long time, uh, but now we know there are actually 500. Um, and they but they did comprise less than 1% of the total catch. Um, but that's a phenomenal number of blue whales, considering we, we hear or see so, so little of them um, these days. Um, interestingly, despite the fact that most of the whaling effort was conducted up in Shetland, most of the blue whales were actually caught, a disproportionate number were caught um, just close to St Kilda there, not west of St Kilda. So if, if you were looking for blue whale recovery nowadays, that would be a good place to target to go not west of St Kilda. And here's several blue whales together um, up on the Flensing Plan. Uh, in one month alone, in August 2020, 25 blue whales were killed and landed in Scottish waters. Incredible to think we had that, that num those kind of numbers out there in the 1920s, exactly 100 years ago. Um, same whales are a very interesting case as well. We, we hear, again, very, very few records of same whales, very few confirmed records. They are a difficult species to identify in the field. They can be confused with um, fin whales or minke whales, um, but they made up a quarter of the catch. Um, over 2,000 same whales were landed and particularly concentrated around Shetland, but also you can see records there between Isla and uh, Tyree um, and all up to the uh, west coast of Scotland, but particularly concentrated around Shetland. Um, it's been suggested that say whales um, kind of come and go in big waves, and it's known as say whale years, where you get these big influxes. We looked for evidence of that in the whaling records, and we found no evidence of that. Uh, in fact, say whales were steadily caught year on year um, without without much fluctuation at all. Um, so I'm skeptical of the idea of say whale years in the Northeast Atlantic. I think they used to be very regular here. Here's an example of a picture of a say whale. Usually you can see the, the blowhole and the dorsal fin at the same time. Um, humpbacks, there were very few humpbacks caught. Uh, they were they had been over exploited to the north already before whaling conducted in Scotland. Um, humpbacks were already in a, in a drastic state of decline um, because they were so overhunted in Norwegian waters um, and Icelandic waters as well. So there were only 70 hump, 71 humpbacks landed um, and that didn't really provide us much information about um, their um, ecology, but you can see that they were um, scattered throughout the, the whaling grounds. Um, 100 right whales were landed, and like I mentioned, these are kind of lost from cultural memory. I put an asterisk next to the 100 because in Ian Hart's new book, he's presenting evidence and a theory that, um, that 
right whale numbers were under recorded, he reckons that there's an additional 32 right whales on top of the 100 I'm presenting here um, that were landed. At any rate, I mentioned that the whalers, Norwegian whalers who were um, hunting in Scottish waters, um, they were surprised to see right whales in, in Scottish waters, um, but they, they didn't really hold back, even though they thought that they had been extinct and they found this kind of refuge population, if you like, and they essentially wiped it out, which is, uh, which is terribly sad. Um, and they're now most likely extinct in the Northeast Atlantic. And um, the reason being uh, that the, the whalers used to get a bonus um, for, for right whales, they would get uh, 50 at the, um, the harpooner would get the biggest bonus. The harpooner would get 50p um, for a humpback whale, but five pounds bonus for a right whale. And the equivalent in today's value of a right whale would have been 90,000 pounds per right whale. Um, so they were a very, very lucrative um, catch. The last one was landed in Scottish waters in 1923, and, and that was probably the last um, direct evidence of their occurrence in, in, in Scottish waters. There were some caught in Ireland nearby as well, but the Hebrides seemed to be um, their final stronghold in the Northeast Atlantic. Um, this slide is actually Irish whaling data, and there's another, uh, another paper coming out um, this month about the analysis of whaling data in Ireland. Um, and this graph um, shows something that we also tried for Scotland, but it didn't work as well. Um, but it was a way of looking at, well, when did the whales occur in our waters back then during the whaling period? And what we did was we looked at the catch accumulation. So we looked at what proportions of the catches were caught um, by various months. Um, Probably a little bit tricky to read this graph if you're not used to them, but um, basically the two blue lines there are save whales and right whales. And the take home message here is the catch accumulation happened earlier for those each year than it did for the other species. In other words, they turned up earlier on the whaling grounds than other species did. So we can tell from that. So if you look, use the kind of 50% of the catch threshold, you can tell by June, they'd already caught half of their right whales and say whales for that year. Um, whereas it wasn't until mid-August that they caught half the blue whales in the year. Um, so that means that they, uh, those whales were arriving, uh, say and right whales were arriving early in the year and blue whales were arriving late. Um, so that's interesting. And again, something that we can look for um, traces of uh, in modern day and see um, if these whales are still following the kind of seasonal migration patterns that they once did. Um, so how come this whaling operation was so damaging? Um, there's quite a few features of the whaling in Scotland, which meant it was particularly damaging the whale populations. Um, it was part of a bigger picture. There was at least 11 other whaling stations um, in, in the North Atlantic at the time. Um, Newfoundland, um, Azores, Madeira in the Straits of Gibraltar, um, coastal Portugal, in the northwest of Spain, Ireland, and several stations also in Iceland. Um, so the impact wasn't in isolation. Uh, in fact, the Faroese based uh, shore-based whaling came down to within sight of land in Scotland at times, particularly after whaling had stopped in Scotland in the 1950s. The Faroese were coming down um, clo very close to Scottish waters to catch blue and fin whales. Um, so it was in a wider context of over-exploitation in, in other places. Um, one key element that makes Scotland stand out in particular is the mixed nature, or mixed species nature of the whaling. So what that meant was if one species was in decline, like the right whales and the save whales, you could go out um, on a trip, on a whaling trip, and catch whatever was there. Um, and if... For example, if the whaling in Scotland only targeted right whales, it would have it would have ceased to operate very, very quickly because they would have wiped out all the right whales and there'd be no um, commercially viable reason to go out catching them anymore. So the fact that it could just be focusing on fin whales and then take whatever other species that happened to be around meant that um, they were kind of buffered financially from the risk uh, and um, the fin whales kind of propped up and the capture of other species. Um, so that meant that the whaling in Scotland was particularly damaging and had long lasting effects. Um, 
Something which I was very interested in as well was a feature of the, the kind of topography of the North Atlantic. And um, we know that Scotland is not just a feeding ground for whales, it's also a migration um, route. And any whales that are going from tropical breeding grounds or subtropical breeding grounds up into the high Arctic, and they kind of get funneled past Scotland. Um, and something to point out in that kind of scenario as well is um, any animals that are being exploited on their on their migration route, um, while there's a kind of a flow of animals, um, that can give um, an unrealistic picture. It can, from the perspective of the hunter or the whaler, if animals are flowing past, you will encounter them at the same rate, even if the population is in, in a drastic state of decline. And we see examples of that in the Mediterranean with um, songbirds. So in, in songbirds uh, migration going through Malta and Cyprus and other islands in the Mediterranean, um, there's a flow of animals and the hunters are based on those small islands. And those birds are being funneled through by the topography and they need to land on, on route. And it gives the impression their encounter rate with these birds stays steady, but actually the populations are in decline because they're flowing. And the whales were flowing through this area in Scotland as well. Um, so the catch per unit effort was staying high, as I showed you with fin whales, um, because, um, well, this is our theory anyway, because they were migrating. Um, if it had been their destination, uh, like a breeding ground or at the final feeding ground, you might not have seen that pattern. This was an exercise I did. We didn't publish it, but I just show it because I think it's interesting. I'm still kind of working on it. But if you, if every whale is a blue dot and every line is a, a trail of a hypothetical migration. Um, any whale down at 20 degrees there trying to get up to 70 degrees, um, if it goes left or right or straight, each line I've plotted um, as a kind of a light line. So the, the darker blue that you see would be the more um, whale tracks that would go on this hypothetical migration route. We know these whales do migrate in, a per, in pretty well straight lines from some of the tagging data anyway. Um, but what if, if, you, if you see here where the whaling stations were in red dots in Scotland and Ireland, um, there's a very solid blue line going past them because the whales are kind of squeezed, um, if you like, by the topog topography. Um, so I think um, the whaling stations uh, were well placed um, to target whales on migration. Uh, and that seems to be what they did. Um, so I'll finish up with um, the question about post whaling recovery. Are we seeing recovery of some species? And before I get onto the species that um, I was speaking about so far, it would be remiss not to speak about minke whales. Um, minke whales weren't hunted at all. And there's no evidence that they were landed um, by the Scottish domestic whaling from 1903 to 1951. They probably weren't worth the effort. Um, nowadays, they are hunted nearby in, in Norway. Um, if you're in John O'Groats, you're as close to a whaling ground than you are to Edinburgh. Um, and if you're in Shetland, you're closer to a whaling ground than you are to Edinburgh. Um, the whales are being killed in, in Norwegian waters, but adjacent to, to Scottish waters. The east coast of Scotland is the most important place um, to minke whales in Europe. Um, it is certainly their stronghold, and we're seeing evid evidence of decline, um, a slow but sustained decline in the number of minke whales. Um, I kind of conflate these two things because I think it's, a very, it's very important that when we're designing conservation goals or strategies to protect minke whales in Scottish waters, we have to accept, um, we don't have to accept it, but we have to acknowledge that um, whaling is affecting them um, when they're migrating through uh, from Scottish waters to Norwegian waters, they're at risk of, of being hunted there still today. Um, the biggest threat within Scottish waters is entanglement. Um, and we know now that um, up to 16 minke whales per year are, are dying in creel entanglements um, and some very good work that the Trust has been doing um, in monitoring creels and minke whale occurrence has helped us to establish that. Um, uh, this is also affecting the humpback whales. And I bring up the issue of entanglement because um, in effect, uh, certainly for humpback whales, um, in, entanglement and other threats have effectively replaced whaling uh, to the same degree. Um, so although we no longer have whaling of, of humpback whales here, um, 
the rate at which they're being entangled is, is comparable to the rate at which uh, they were once hunted here. And it's from the creel entanglement issue that we've just learned that humpback whales are increasingly visiting Scottish waters. Um, I used to be very reluctant to say that humpbacks are making a recovery in Scotland um, because I didn't think the evidence was really there. And now the evidence um, from via the entanglement analysis um, is, is quite clear. So the graph on the right shows the number of humpback whale visits um, um, to Scottish inshore waters and certainly and you can see that they're going up all the time. Um, unfortunately, although we're um, you know more whales in our waters is a good good story perhaps. Unfortunately, it means um, there may be more entanglements. Um, so it becomes a welfare concern. One thing we don't know is is this a distribution shift that they're more in coastal waters than they used to be, or is it a genuine population recovery? Are the actual population sizes growing, or it could be both. Um, and here's an example of one uh, whale that survived entanglement. So they don't all die, they become entangled um, and some can free themselves. Um, but obviously it's quite an agonizing death if they, if they do die. And so it's probably one of our biggest challenges today um, in, in Scottish waters. And I bring that up because, uh, like I say, it, it's from that um, type of analysis we've discovered that humpbacks are increasingly found in Scottish waters. Um, so where our humpback whales breed is an important kind of piece in the puzzle if we're talking about uh, recovery. Um, and uh, humpbacks in Scottish waters breed both in the West Indies and in Cape Verde. And whalers were operating down in those places on their breeding ground as well, uh, um, but earlier than, than the Scottish uh, whaling um, industry was operating. And the two populations are separated because they, well, they're, they were separated until recently, um, but they're denoted by different colors here. So the abundance of humpback whales in the North Atlantic in the 1850s was about 30,000 or close to it. Um, and 12% of those were Cape Verdean. Nowadays, um, we have about 15,000 humpback whales in the North Atlantic, but only 0.2 of them um, have this Cape Verdean um, uh, genetic heritage. And they're being replaced by West Indies whales. Um, and you might say, so what? So when you talk about whale recovery, um, it's also important to think about the genetic heritage. So humpback whales are from the West Indies are increasing, but at the expense of Cape Verdean um, genotype whales. And you might say, so what? A humpback is a humpback. But in that Cape Verdean genetic heritage could be perhaps a gene um, or a trait that helps them in, you know, to recover from the next Episootic, the next, the next disease that might hit them, for example, um, if there was some type of flu or virus, uh, you want uh, you want a, a diverse um, gene pool to be able to um, for populations to bounce back from natural and random events, and we're we're losing that in, um, and that is a Scottish issue as well because, like I say, both of our uh, our whales, our humpback whales from Scotland, come from both uh, Cape Verde and West Indies. Um, fantastic work by uh, Ninka Van Giel and um, uh, Denise Reich and others in SAMS um, will help look at the, the and it'll help answer the question of whale recovery in other species, perhaps, or at least it helps us to look at well which ones still occur in our waters today. So this is um, a very condensed overview, um, but a nice graphic of acoustic monitoring um, in the old whaling ground um, that I showed you maps of earlier on. So you can see on the top there fin whales and the yellow boxes show um, um, whale presence and blue boxes show whale absence or certainly the absence of um, their vocalizations. Of course they can be there and be silent potentially. Um, so fin whales are very much present in, in the former whaling grounds. Humpbacks you can see are seasonally present which fits with what we know about their migration routes being quite strict um, to certain seasons. Minke whales are kind of present and sporadic throughout the year. And um, say whales are barely present. There's uh, some evidence that very few are, are present. Um, but certainly it's a very different picture to what we saw um, in the whaling data. Um, no evidence of blue whale calls in this particular data set, although it was just from one year. Um, so I'm holding out hope that longer, long-term monitoring using acoustics might find blue whales. Um, but notable in their absence in 2021 in the former whaling ground. Um, I'll finish up very soon, but just to say um, 
something that's always stuck out in my mind. I, I kind of cut my teeth as a biologist in, in Cork in Ireland. And um, my one of my field sites was um, down in the, in the Celtic Sea, uh, where we used to see fin whales close to shore quite regularly, um, groups of up to 12 or so um, within sight of land. Um, sometimes you go to a headland and you'd hear the whales blowing before you um, could actually see them because they were so close to the coast. And we'd see them stirring up the dust, the sediment on the, on the seabed because they were so close to the coast. Um, it's interesting that that only seems to be happening um, in, in a big way in places where the whalers didn't operate. So there was no whaling stations down in the Celtic Sea. And I've often wondered um, if, uh, if that might be one of the reasons you still have this population that comes so close to shore. And uh, perhaps there were coastal populations like this in, in Scotland, but they were wiped out because of the coastal whaling. Um, who knows? Um, a particularly interesting thing that we've learned from the whaling records as well is that the whalers recognised two forms of fin whales. They, um, particularly in Ireland, the, the paper I mentioned that's coming out this month in the Irish Naturalist Journal, um, I go into a bit more detail on that, but there are two forms of fin whales that the whalers saw. They saw dark, smaller ones which fed on fish, and they saw pale, large ones which fed more on krill. Um, so that's quite interesting, and it'd be it'd be very useful to know if two uh, two different types of fin whales still occur in, in these waters. Uh, so something to look out for in the future. So just by way of conclusion, before I take some questions, um, firstly to say that I think um, we need to start thinking about whale conservation in, um, in terms of um, um, welfare as well as populations. You know, you could, you could say that some whaling operations might be and sustainable in the sense that the population can cope with a certain number of whales being killed. Um, but certainly the way whales are killed even today is still um, is still quite cruel. I would go so far as to say barbaric. Um, and I think um, legislation needs to reflect um, societal values on, on how much we care about these animals and their welfare, not just for whaling, but for other issues, uh, even in Scottish waters as well. Um, I know it's a quite a depressing topic. Um, <laughs> and might leave you a bit sad, um, but I would like to um, kind of end on a positive note and just to think about, you know, the potential that our waters have um, for those species that are, are still left, even in small numbers. You know, we know now from the whaling data where their habitat was, where there was suitable habitat for them, and that should really give us hope for um, places that they should be able to recover and repopulate again. Uh, maybe this is happening and we just haven't had the research effort, um, but certainly the work that's being done in SAMS in Oban, the acoustic monitoring is incredible and that will go a long way towards answering the question um, of recovery. Um, so the conclusions, just to sum up, um, whaling definitely had a greater impact in Scotland than was previously recognised and now we know, for example, there was a lot more blue whales. Um, it, there may actually, we may still be underestimating the number of right whales that were landed here um, and future work needs to be done on that. Um, the extinction of the Eastern North Atlantic right whale um, very probably happened in, in the Hebridean whaling uh, and was probably a direct consequence of, of that whaling. Um, and the, the blame for that lies solely with one person basically because he was the owner of that whaling station um, and continued to hunt them when with full knowledge that they were uh, close to extinction. Um, fin and humpback whales are making a measurable recovery regionally. Um, both uh, species are uh, increasing um, at something below 3% um, uh, every decade. Um, like I say, entanglement and other threats are perhaps replaced the effects of whaling locally in, in our coastal waters, and we need to be very, very careful about that. Um, and um, the effects of whaling on species like sea whales seems to have been particularly bad um, but not really um, spoken about or uh, not really recognised until recently. Um, the lack of sea whales in our waters compared to what we used to have is, is quite marked. Um, and lastly, to point out that historical whaling research can be done from one's bedroom um, <laughs> during lockdown. Um, one of the great things about uh, the, you know, increasingly digitised world is a lot of these um, sources of information and archives from um, uh, various institutions are now available digitally and just a final note to say that we should support our ar archives they're incredibly important um, sources of information and support our, our museums um, who hold these um, 
incredible sources of information that we can tuck into over 100 years later. And um, so that's all I have to say for now.